All right, welcome everybody to Inside Quest. We are the sculptor for your malleable mind. Our goal is to bring on amazing people who can help you shape your brain into something more powerful. And if you're looking to radically transform your intellect, there's no better guest than the man joining us today. He's a psychiatrist, scientist, and award-winning poet all wrapped into one. With a unique ability to blend the scientific and the soulful, his work and insights in the fields of neuroscience and human behavior have resonated with a mainstream audience more than perhaps any other writer in the field. A faculty member at both the University of Toronto's Department of Psychiatry and Columbia University's Center for Psychoanalytic Training and Research, he is one of the most notable authorities in the area of brain plasticity. He has written over 170 articles in his area of expertise, and his work has appeared in the Wall Street Journal, Harvard Business Review, U.S. News and World Report, and the Chicago Sun-Times, just to name a few. His smash hit New York Times best-selling book, The Brain That Changes Itself, was selected by the journal Cerebrum as the best best general book on the brain out of 30,000 English language books on the topic. I do consider his works must-reads for anyone interested in gaining intellectual and emotional freedom. In short, this man is one of the people that helped me escape the matrix by showing me and the rest of the world the phenomenal power inherent in the brain's ability to physically rewire itself through thought alone. Let that sink in. And his latest book, The Brain's Way of Healing, is another revelatory effort that chronicles some utterly astonishing tales of neuroplastic brain recovery from the very cutting edge of the science. His ability to take the most complex of topics and make them accessible is so rare and readily apparent in his work that the Globe and Mail dubbed him the master of explaining science to the rest of us. Please help me in welcoming the man whose work has been profiled or cited everywhere from O, oh, the Oprah magazine, to the New York Times, and who has been called remarkable, haunting, and memorable, Dr. Norman Doidge. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming on the show. It is an absolute pleasure to have you on. I'm being really sincere, and these guys know uh, how important the metaphor of the Matrix is to me. And I put together a list of the books that really helped me get out. And The Brain That Changes Itself it was just a seminal book for me, what I call a quake book. I think I sold that from <laughs> Ryan Holiday, so don't give me too much credit. But um, really, really had a powerful impact on me. But before we get into that, I sit down and I ask myself what the thing is I most want to know about the guest. And that's usually where I start. And sometimes it's not necessarily uh, what they wrote in their book. The thing that I most want to know is what drew you to poetry? Uh, it's condensed speech, it's, it's, it's the music side, the emotion uh, connected with uh, thought. So it gets the left brain and the right brain together. Um, you know, it's one of those th things that for me, I, w I was so drawn that I didn't think, w it seemed to me self-evident that it was beautiful. <laughs> uh, if you think about it, language is an invention and it allows us to take our thoughts and convert them into sound, that, that's, that's a medium. That's already something that's highly developed, and it's been around for millennia. And so it's really, in a way, incredibly refined. It's, it's our true window into subjectivity. And with all of the refinements in all of the world's languages over millennia, it's um, maybe the most sophisticated way that you can get at the human soul. Uh, not that there aren't wow. other nonverbal ways. And poetry for me is the most condensed, heightened uh, expression of language. So I think that that's why I was drawn to it. That's a pretty damn good answer. To get at the soul, I'll take that. Um, one of the things that I find so amazing, and you've really been rightfully championed for your ability to bring the humanity to science, at least from an experiential standpoint, it's clear to me that that's why your books have done so well, is you're talking about this really heady stuff, right? I mean, we're at the, the cutting edge of neuroscience with uh, the battle that I'm sure you had to fight with plasticity in the early days and people didn't believe that it was real and that it was hardwired and you, you know you've talked very eloquently about that and some of your other talks I won't make you repeat that here but it becomes so accessible and understandable hearing that answer um, is is really great and one thing that you guys will see as you dig deeper into his world he's you're very very cautious about overstating the state of the science I'm glad you picked that up and, and, and that's very clear and I think um, 
doesn't feel like someone trying to dodge something in a way that a lot of times it does. And it feels more like you allowing room for the humanity. Is that, is that what's happening or? Well, there's several things happening. Um, one is I'm a terrible salesman. Uh, <laughs> Quite seriously. Okay. I mean, a good salesman is, in some ways, should be able to sell anything. They should be able to sell salt to people who don't need salt. I right. can't do that. Um, so when I get behind something, I've really, or make an argument, I really have tried to figure out everything that's wrong with that argument before I impose it on somebody. But the poetry actually was very helpful because having made a transition from a love of literature and philosophy into medicine and then in science, I would hear people talking about uh, organisms and scientific process, living scientific processes using a very mechanistic language. And as a very young uh, doctor, I didn't want to presume that uh, I understood what was wrong with that, but it did seem a little odd that people would always describe the body very mechanistically in science. And because it's the body is animate and machines are inanimate and the brain of course was described very much as a machine and the you know the ruling metaphor the master analogy about the brain now is that it's like a computer now again that seemed wrong but it was only when i spent you know years studying it that i could see what was wrong with it and as i saw what was wrong with it i was able to see i think that a lot of the scientists didn't realize they were working with metaphors. Mm. And those metaphors were trapping them. Metaphors in poetry are something you use to express something for a moment, but you have to be aware that it's a metaphor. A metaphor can end up concealing more than it reveals if you're captured by the metaphor. And it sounds to me like you have a sensitivity to how we can be trapped by our ideas. And so I was able to see that this machine metaphor for the brain was making people think that the circuitry was fixed and hardwired. Mm. And the, the metaphors were always changing. 400 years ago, the metaphor for the brain from the philosopher Rene Descartes was that it was like the nerves were like um, hollowed out uh, plumbing and currents moved up and down the nerves. And we still speak of currents, but now electrical currents. Then they changed, the model changed as we developed electrical machines to an elect, um, you know, something like a circuit board. But no one could conceive of a non-hardwired circuit board, so we started to think of the brain as hardwired. And now with a computer, uh, people tend, in that master analogy, to think thought is something like the software and uh, the brain is the hardware. But what we really find, if we just can speak about the brain on its own terms and not in terms of that metaphor, is thought actually can change the physical structure of the so-called hardware and its function. And once you realize that and dig into what the laws of that are, uh, some very interesting poss you know, possibilities arise. And so because I'm a doctor, I started to look at, particularly in the first book, what illnesses or conditions that you know, people were suffering from could be changed. And part of that was to help those people, of course. And part of it was to s test the idea. If it was really true, you should be able to change some illnesses. By the second book, I'm looking at some pretty substantial se severe neurological conditions and finding that they can sometimes be changed too. Not always, but sometimes, and sometimes radically. So it's a test of the concept. And, um, at a certain point, the scales fall from one's eyes and you realize we've got a lot of things about the brain quite wrong. You know, I talked about a girl who was born with half a brain and she's missing the left hemisphere, which we use to process language. And she, sh you know, you would think she would be in the ICU with tubes in and out of her, but that's not the case. Her brain rewired itself and, she, you know, she can speak and she votes in elections and she has her favorite basketball team and so on. Now, that means that the brain is not nearly as localized, particularly the outer parts of the brain, for sure, as, as we thought, but even some of the deep parts of the brain. So think about that. What, what does that mean, that you know, th thoughts and, that are not localized to modules? 
I think about that more than you can imagine. Uh, you've said that you think that neuroplasticity is the most important advancement in our thinking about the brain in the last several hundred years. Why? And why should these guys care? Okay. So, I think it's the most important change in our understanding of the brain in several hundred years. Everybody thought that the circuitry was formed and finalized in childhood. Uh, and that gave rise to a view of human development, human potential, that taught people that you're stuck with what you're born with in a kind of absolute way. I mean, one case after another in my second book, people are told, you know, your child will never get better, you will never get better, and so on. Uh, it's not possible. You, you know, if you had a stroke uh, when you were being born and you have cerebral palsy, that, you know, the assumption was that's it. If you tried to maintain your brain as you got older, that was seen as kind of a waste of time. But even if we're not talking in medical terms, your conception of what's possible, let's say, in the second half of life is radically altered uh, when you understand that there's plasticity from cradle to grave. You can reinvent uh, yourself in, in certain respects, take on skills you never dreamed that you could take on. Um, throughout the course of your life. That's an incredibly liberating thought. Um, and not only can you, but if you don't challenge your brain, uh, you're, it probably won't maintain itself. So, you know, the brain, just like the body, requires some intensive work just for maintenance. Uh, and it's okay to do that. It's necessary to do that. One thing that you talked about, and, and it stopped me in my tracks in the most recent book, and I really want these guys to, to understand this, is the concept that there's a dark side to this, right? It's very beautiful that you can change your brain, and uh, we'll talk a little bit about um, the guy that had Parkinson's and used walk therapy and, and becoming very conscious of how he moved to actually relocate the learning center for how to walk to a different area of his brain. Mm -hmm. But on the other side of that is all the little lies that you tell yourself about yourself, the limitations, the belief systems that hold you back, they hardwire and they become real. And it can be something as tangible as pain, right? And your brain gets so used to a sense of pain or whatever that it becomes a chronic pain and now you can't shake it and, and he will definitely talk about some amazing stuff in his book about how to deal with that. But honestly, honestly, the thing you guys should look to the yourself and the people in your life that you're hoping will help lead you where you want to go is one very simple thing, is to help you construct a brain that serves you. It really boils down to that basic, right? And one thing that I'm always trying to search for is, what is where does it stop, right? What's the bottom line? Where there's nothing more recursive than that. And to me, the plasticity of the brain is that moment where you reach sort of the last stop on the recursive train, and it's like, okay, this is an issue of wiring my brain. So it, walk them through the story of the chronic pain and how Moskowitz, I forget his yeah, name. Yeah, Moskowitz. That okay. Whew. You, did, you did know it, you just didn't know that you knew it. Yes, I didn't have faith in myself, which I'll punish myself <laughs> for later. Um, but yeah, Moskowitz and what he did with the chronic pain, because that story changed me forever. Oh, really? Okay, so let me step back. Um, a lot of learning disorders have to do with the ability to take in things through your senses. And if those senses aren't all that well developed, let's say reading or sound, re sorry, reading might involve visual intake, it also may a language involves sound intake. If those initial processors that uh, deal with sense impressions coming at us are unrefined, you could end up with a learning disorder. So we have training techniques by which we can develop them and make them more differentiated. That can change a life with a kid with a learning disorder. Now, the perfection of the senses is a blessing in that, those situations. But the same plasticity um, that allows us to perfect our senses can be a curse when it comes to certain kinds of pain experiences, because pain is kind of a sense, isn't it? So there's really two kinds of pain. There's an acute pain, um, which 
uh, tells you that there's damage to part of the body and we don't welcome it, but it actually is essential for our survival. And some people who are born with a genetic uh, tendency not to be able to feel pain, well, they tend to die very young because they'll hurt their foot, they won't notice it, and they'll die of an infection. Chronic pain is damage not only to the part of the body, but to the, the nervous part of the pain system itself. So what happened with Michael Moskowitz is he was a psychiatrist turned pain physician, and he, he had a number of mishaps or accidents. One of them had to do with a kind of a skiing accident, and so he wrecked his neck. Initially, it hurt him just around the neck, but the nerve get, kept getting pinched over and over again. And so the brain got really good at registering that pain, and what was initially a kind of just a strong thrust of pain, lasting seconds, as the brain got better at processing it, and got kind of noisy, that's another concept I have, the pain would last longer and it started to spread from his neck to his head to his shoulders and soon his upper back. And he was stuck with a chronic pain syndrome. Now, he started reading about plasticity at this time. And as a pain physician, he tried everything for that chronic pain. So he tried all the medications, which are problematic, to say the least nerve blocks, so injections into various nerves, and a lot of complementary things, all the ones he knew about, and he was very open-minded, and nothing touched it. Most of us think that there's a, probably a pain center in the brain that registers all of this pain, but in fact, there's about a dozen different centers in the brain, and that's the first thing to know. But what's interesting about them is they're, they're distributed through the brain, and they they, in general, are dual purpose centers. So you may have noticed when you're in pain, you might be irritable and have emotional regulation problems, or you can't pay attention, or you can't do higher math. Now there's reasons for all of this. So one of the areas that um, registers pain also registers emotion. And what's happening there is the part, when you have ac acute pain, a small part of that area will light up. When it becomes chronic, about another 20% of that map will light up and it in literally invades the processing areas of emotion. Mm. So it's not as good at processing emotion. Um, plasticity is competitive within the brain. The same thing can happen to the attention areas and to visual areas. So what Moskowitz thought to do was, every time I feel that pain, I will visualize something. It didn't matter what he visualized, interestingly enough. Um, to see if I can take back that part of my visual map that is being hijacked by pain. So he, he visualized three actual brain scans. One of the brain not in pain, so the pain areas are not lit up. One of the brain in acute pain, and so you'd have about a dozen areas that had little pinpricks of neuronal firing. And then one of the brain in chronic pain, and these pinpricks become supernovas. Mm. And he just imagined every time he felt any pain whatsoever, kind of dialing it back from supernova to pinprick right. to nothing. He does this several weeks, and he's always in pain, so he's always doing it, no result. By the end of, you know, another week, he notices he's, you know, got about 10 seconds free of pain. This is after years of pain. Not even sure it was right. Mm. By the end of several months, you know, he's got 15, 20 minutes free of pain. By the end of a year of doing this every time it comes up, he's off all his pain meds, and he's, he's completely pain-free. Wow. He's, he's destroyed his chronic pain syndrome. And then he started to explore other, working with other maps, including vibration maps, which are interesting, because the vibration signal travels faster than the pain signal in the body. Sound worked for some of his patients. So, yeah, I would immerse myself in his work, visit him on a number of occasions, meet with his patients. Uh, one of the, the things with that, that because it's such a long cycle, I, I always worry that people think that something's not working when really they haven't given it enough time to work, right? And the reason I want to drive a nail into this point is this book 
is on my list for a reason. The reason that I think they're so powerful is it's the one thing that I use in every aspect of my life. It's the one concept you hear me talk about that I think about every day. It's the one thing that I put to use every day. So, you know, take today for an instance. You guys, you're, you're working up in your life, right? And what happens is you get to a point, you allow yourself to believe that there are certain things about you that are true, right? And then you feel comfortable there. But to get to that next level, you're gonna have to believe new things about yourself. Now your mind is gonna combat that because it's safe here, right? It understands you as this. For you to get to that next level, it's gonna throw all kinds of roadblocks, whether they be um, throwing up anxiety, whether it's doubt, whether, who knows? right there's going to be a whole host of things the simple nagging voice but the techniques of catching that you know in this case he's referring to pain but in in his book he really details like how diligent this guy is and how people make comments about how diligent he is and how much time he allocates this and he doesn't give up and he keeps going and that really when you look at the people in your life that have been successful the one thing you don't see that diligence right i saw this really cool image and it shows an iceberg right and it says iceberg success and then of course underneath it shows all that hard ass work that they put in to the part that you see in my first book i describe people working with obsessions and compulsions and it's a very similar thing they have recurring thoughts that just won't go away and they 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 really have to know that you measure the success of that day by just thinking about how much effort you put into it, not whether the obsession or compulsion went away or the chronic pain went away that day. Because you're creating like a new gear shift inside your brain that will, that's built, being built up from scratch so that you have conscious control over this to change it. And, and that takes a while. Yeah, that's uh, how much effort you put in that, that that's really important. Because there are days where it does seem like I'm not making any progress. You start to feel lost. There's so many potential avenues to try. Sometimes that's actually when you are making the progress. Uh, that's, when you are, that's when you're building up that new network. But as you're building up the network, you don't get an immediate reward. Right. That, that's just so important to know. Uh, the way plastic change works is you, know, you, you put in the effort, some, then you, you go to sleep at night. Some of those uh, connections in the brain are consolidated. Um, then you, you know, you can have setbacks and something like chronic pain and you don't see that you've built that little gear shift. It's, you know, it's a tiny amount of circuitry that's in that switch area. That's what you're working on. What are some critical things that you've learned? Do you have children? Yeah. What are some critical things you've learned that you want to make sure that you pass on to them? Like if you could only leave them three concepts, what would those three concepts be? I mean, the first one, I guess, is the issue, and it's sort of like the Carol Dweck kind of stuff, that the mindset should not be conceived of as simply whether you've got a reward today, but you understand that to be a human being, to have a brain, is to be a creature that learns, and a lot of learning is incremental and slow. That's the first thing. The second thing is, um, thinking holistically about yourself, not treating yourself like a machine simply. It seems to go against perhaps what we, I, I've just said, but always thinking in terms of the guiding meaning of life. What's, what's meaningful for you at a meta level? Um, I think that's really important. Um, Do you think that there is um, an objective meaning or is it pure subjectivity? Bias sneaks into the science all the time, which means subjectivity is very, very powerful. Now, um, one of the ways I like to look at this now is in the following. In that modern scientific view, the idea is that the world is, is real, is out there, and that's what's real. Right. So this is like a really important thing as far as I'm concerned. Um, it also kind of implies that the mind is less real. Now, you know, f because it's, quote, subjective and it's different and varies. I see it differently. I see that the sensory world impacts upon consciousness and we register it. And that's how we know the world. That's pretty real. But I also see the internal psyche from our unconscious minds, um, from our unconscious experiences, from our very personal experiences, they also impact 
us at the level of consciousness. I cannot see why that is less real. At the beginning of modern science, the understanding was that subjectivity could distort our experiences, and therefore the subjective is merely subjective. Right. But we all know about optical illusions. We all know that we can get things wrong. And we all know that groups of people often get things more wrong. Sometimes crowds are stupider than individuals, you know, the emperor who has no clothes. So I don't privilege the outside over the, the subjective. And why am I saying this now? Um, it has to do with my immersion in plasticity. Mainstream neuroscience for the longest time has been proudly reductionistic. Here's what that means. If you were to ask 95% of neuroscientists, you know, what they make of the mind-body connection, mm. they would say that the mind is what the brain does. I mean, go on the internet, go into science books, they say it all the time, and this is a brain, um, and in these neurons are all of your thoughts. No one's ever shown that simply. They, they couldn't tell you where in the neurons the thoughts are. Right. They can't, say, they can't tell you, is it in a single neuron, is it between neurons, is it in the activity of the neurons. Honestly, that hasn't been sorted out yet. Um, we know that the brain is necessary for thought in some way, of course, and we know certain parts of the brain are often necessary for thoughts, and yet we also know that sometimes if those parts are damaged, other parts can t be taken over. Um, but there's just so much that's not understood yet about the mind-brain connection. And really I think fast, can, I'm going to put to you a question that you've put to other people and you never seem to present a satisfying conclusion, so I fear it's because you're not satisfied yet, but define the mind. Uh, you know, I'm of the position that there are certain words that cannot be defined yet and that's why everyone's saying, what is mind? We say, yeah. what is mind? What is life? What is the universe? The reason we're asking those questions is because these words are symbols, and, they st and there t there's two kinds of symbols in the world. There are the symbols like the letter A, which sounds, stands for the sound A. Then there are other symbols, equally important, maybe even more important, that stand for things that we only partially understand. And mind, I believe, is one of those words. Life is one of those words. Um, the universe is one of those words. We don't exactly know the boundaries of the universe. We don't exactly know the, the true boundary between animate and inanimate life and non-life. And that's totally legitimate. Aristotle often said, each science has different measures and we have different levels of knowledge. And it's the arrogance of our our arrogance that assumes that we understand things. What is consciousness is the big unsolved um, issue in modern neuroscience, and that's okay. Okay, so that was two things that you would impart to your children. We got the third MIA. What's our third? Oh. You gave us a beautiful, um, <laughs> you know, elucidation of number two, but. Oh, I mean, because I, 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 don't, I wouldn't stop at two or three, so you're, you're forcing me to prioritize. Yes. Um, I don't even know. I, I would, at some level, I would say, do not allow anyone to force you to, be, to prioritize things. Cause <laughs> <laughs> because, you know, reality is changing and shifting. All right. Um, and I learned this first as a psychiatrist. Um, I do think consciousness is the tip of the iceberg. And there's a lot more to us than our conscious parts. And as a shrink, sometimes I would be sitting with a patient. It didn't happen a lot. And I would just get a sense, maybe a feeling in my stomach, that something is wrong, there's a mismatch here. And I couldn't put my finger on it. Because human beings can cover up, they can deceive themselves, they can deceive others. Right. And over the years, I've learned to listen to that. So, and it, it, it goes with something that's, I guess, a, a something that's found a, found a metaphysical foundational thought for me increasingly. 
it's consistent with everything I've said with you so far. Um, you know, go back to Rumsfeld, who got it actually from a philosopher. There's the things you know, there's the things you don't know, and there's the things you don't know you don't know. Right. I also think there are the things that you know that you don't know that you know. And that stomach feeling I would have with a patient was information, in a way, coming from my subconscious. And you can have that at work, you can have that in a love affair. Mm. I listen to that. What do you think is the most interesting question in neuroscience right now? What's the one that fills you with the most awe? Um, you know, the borders of what, what mental is. What would you say is the most important thing for people to understand about their own brains that maybe is often misunderstood? Oh my goodness. Um, uh, th that silence you hear, that's, that's the sound of thinking, <laughs> uh, which sometimes I do. I, I mean, there's several things. I, I think the balance is that on the one hand, we've learned some very interesting specific things about certain brain areas and how br the brain can color experience. Um, but to understand that it's, it's a living, growing, always changing uh, organ, um, I mean, that's part of it. Um, Part of it is the role of incrementalism in building up skills, I think. You know, Aristotle had this very impressive idea that, you know, human beings are happiest and they flourish when they use their best capacities all at once together. Mm. That's when you feel most alive, he thought. But I think that there is something to it, that we're, when we're most in the zone, we're using most of our most advanced parts of ourselves mm. together. But just in terms of the issues of limitations, I'm increasingly drawn to this idea. The reason I, I'm, I'm very drawn to it lately is, is thinking through a lot of the problems in modern medicine. Um, you know, there's this ancient archetype of the healer. And when you meet a real healer, you know it. And they may or may not be a physician, they may or may not be a helping professional, but they often are. And you never know what their techniques are. Their techniques could be complementary, they could be a mainstream surgeon. I mean, you never know, but you can feel it. And just as a warrior is devoted to a certain kind of fighting and a willingness to sacrifice his or her life, a healer is really, really devoted to other people and has a certain kind of sensitivity. And I'm, I'm honing in on these things because I think to some extent the healers have been suppressed in modern medicine to some degree by all these systems and management and having to see patients for eight minutes and all, all, the, and all the technology that gets between the, the doctor and the patient. And the warrior metaphor has been introduced into modern medicine about 400 years ago. It's the battle against AIDS, combating heart mm -hmm. disease. And there are times when the warrior metaphor makes a lot of sense. You know, if you pop a blood vessel in your brain, you don't want a neurosurgeon with martial virtue. But it's like, it's, it's dominated everything. And really so much about healing is just a different universe. It's about balance. Um, it's about respecting nature, that the, the surgeon may cut the wound, the surgeon may bring together the two parts of skin, but nature does the healing, this kind of thing. So. I'm thinking through, I would want my kids to know if there is an archetype that they, they, they have, what that is, and um, explore that. See if they feel um, that they're more able to flourish and use all of themselves. Because one of the things that we see happens in the course of life is in the first parts of our part of our lives. You know, we want to learn how to make a living. There's nothing wrong with that. And we want to learn perhaps how to love. Maybe some of us want to have a family, a lot of us do. Um, and we often have to suppress parts of ourselves to get those things accomplished. And I increasingly think that if you suppress a major part of yourself, for too long, 
you'll actually get sick or world weary or your soul will ache like crazy. And so you want to really know like, if you're doing that kind of suppression. And this is more my psychoanalytic side than my neuroplastic side, I guess. But I, I think it's great. How do people figure that out? Well, you have to learn to listen to yourself really carefully and just notice those moments. And your dreams help you do it. That's one of the things that psychoanalysts figured out early on. So, but it comes up at different times in the course of your life, key times. And in so much of life is trying to balance all of these things. And when we talk about having a meaningful life, it's inviting that other part perhaps that we've shut out for a while back in and trying to integrate that so that you can do something where you can A, make a living and B, feel you're doing what you think is the right thing and use all of yourself. And you will ache or get neurotic if, you're, if, you, if, if you push it too hard. Um, now, so, so many human beings are forced to do that by circumstance, by poverty, by war by God knows what. But sometimes we do it to ourselves. We just don't listen to that part uh, until maybe we get sick in some way. Mm. Does that make sense to you? More than you could possibly know. Yeah. Uh, it, so in the beginning of this, I was desperately trying to get you to match my energy and now I have completely succumbed to the hypnotic uh, revelations that you have been giving one at a time until finally you bring me all back home with that, which I think is incredibly powerful and um, is, makes your work seem an even bigger web than I thought coming into this. And what I just heard is so true to my experience um, and I certainly hope that everybody is listening and heard the same thing that I just heard because you can, I have lost years of my life not acknowledging a, a truth about who I am, not acknowledging, I've never thought of it in terms of being an archetype, but in terms of things that are my natural state, where I am at um, in neutral as I like to think of it, and trying to so I'm a very goal-oriented person, but I find that the most dangerous act you can do as a human being, the thing most close to walking a tightrope is the selection of your goals mm -hmm. if you're ambitious. Because an ambitious person, once they pick that goal, they can spend years running in a direction that does not make them feel at ease, that does not bring them peace, that does not allow them to grow and develop and feel more powerful. And one of the things that drew me to neuroplasticity and to your work in the beginning was I had gone so far afield of who I really was. And these guys know this story, but um, for your benefit. So my partners and I, for eight and a half years, we built a company that we just wanted to sell and make money. And um, I actually said, I'm gonna turn off my natural instincts and I'm gonna just jump into business and pursue business for what that means. Spreadsheets, profitability, um, all that stuff. And, and not do the things that are natural to me, which is to connect, which is to be authentic, which is to empathize. Um, to revel in that feeling that you get when you're compassionate for somebody. Um, we just had Stephen Kotler um, on the show and he talked about uh, helpers high. And when he said it, I thought, oh my God, like that's so real for me. Like helping other people is what I love to do. Like I really, I get the helpers high. Like it makes me feel connected and useful. And those are certainly things that I value in my life. So having walked a path that led so far away from anything that made me feel centered um, and then using neuroplasticity to find my way back was so transformative and it it's one of those things that it so impacts you you cannot help right you couldn't help but write these ideas down because you want the rest of the world to learn easily what you learned so hard right and it may have even been Aristotle or, or um, Socrates who said read for you can learn easily what one man you know had to suffer for the very nature of the show is what you just walked us through which is that these tools are so powerful 
and they can help you find that center and you can build a life even if you're starting somewhere very far apart. And let's take a childhood trauma. You know, I think so many people are touched by childhood trauma in their life and it, it catches their brain development at a certain time and it, it really begins this fragmentation process where you've got the, the hurts of that trauma which pull you down a path which is not necessarily in sync with who you naturally are and there's then this constant battle. And the message that I take from your books are that you don't have to be the person that's pulled down that path that does not make sense for you. And if it makes you feel off balance and off center and agitated and all of that, the techniques that you outline, yes, they take a tremendous amount of effort and you cannot get discouraged um, that you have to put that effort in and it won't be immediate. But to recognize that you can work your way back to that, that the brain will rewire itself. And as long as you have your sights set on something that is you centered, there are, and he talks so well about energy without it becoming woo woo and talking about meridians and things in the body, they're real and you can measure them. And, and it just so happens that it has a word that's sort of gotten bastardized over time. But, you know, using those energies, whether it's vibration, whether it's laser light, whether it's um, sound, you know, some of the things that you, that you talk so powerfully in your book about, um, that you can find your way back, right? And that realization, um, not only do I think that it can get you back to neutral, but I think that it can take you well beyond and that you can begin to empower yourself and embolden yourself, um, which is why the matrix as a metaphor speaks so well to me is you have somebody who starts and they're way far from neutral in the wrong direction. And then you see them work their way to neutral as they wake up in the real world and see that they have control and, and then discovering the lengths to which they can take their powers through effort. So, Thank you. That was um, truly impactful. You know, it's interesting if you if you bring the brain back into this. One of the things about being plastic creatures is we can ride off in di in direct different directions. Um, you know, if we were really like mechanical and pre-designed for certain purposes perfectly, we wouldn't, in a way, run into certain problems. We can be influenced by other people. Um, we can pour ourselves into certain shapes, if you will. And, you know, we are resilient. And the resiliency in some ways is very good, but it also means we can also end up doing a lot of what we don't want to be doing for a long time. And you can be deceived by the fact that you are resilient and that you can go down paths you don't want to go down. But at a certain point, you know, there will be a crisis. And, you know, a lot of us push ourselves always to that crisis. Um, and it's only in the crisis that we learn about it. So some people think one of the things that dreams do or even sometimes neurotic symptoms do is they're, try they're, they're signs from our emotional life saying um, you're ignoring something. There has to be a correction here. So you learn to listen to those things. And I cannot thank you enough for your thank time. Thank you. Norman, that was incredible. Thank you. Incredible. <laughs> uh, wow. Well, if you guys just had the same experience that I had, that was amazing. Um, I like to let these shows go where they're going to go and bring on unique people like Dr. Deutsch here who um, really have digested an entire universe of information and presented it in a way that's usable for you. The more you read about him, the more you will realize that every insight that he has um, is exactly what you saw today. It's science married with soul, delivered in a way that is so human and so accessible that it's immediately applicable to your life. Uh, when I first read his book, it hit me with that level of immediacy. You feel like you're being written to directly, like he's looking at you and you alone uh, and telling you exactly what you need to hear to get to that next level. Um, his books are powerful. You can put them to use to accomplish pretty much whatever you want in your life. Are there limits? Sure, maybe. Um, 
but there's so much beauty and awe in how far you can take it that I'm excited for the journey that you guys are gonna go on. We'd love to hear about it. Drop in the comments, let us know what you're working on. How are you putting your brain's plasticity to use? How far do you think it can go? I'd love to hear that and get into that dialogue with you guys. Man, if you haven't, be sure to subscribe. You never know if you're gonna get a jolt of adrenaline um, or a laid back, uh, just hypnotic trance. So this shit is, Amazing, so I'm so grateful uh, for the people that come on the show and allow us to do this. So Norman, where can they find you online? NormanDoidge.com. All right, perfect. Uh, so yeah, sign up and check us out on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, at InsideQuest. And for tickets, if you wanna come and take uh, the natural opiates that are flowing around the room right now, uh, you can grab tickets at InsideQuest.com and click on Get Tickets. Boys and girls, until next week, be legendary, my friends. Take care. Thank you.